Hey everyone, Dr. Baron Grutter here. In this video, I'm just going to show you how to use D3 Splint uh, in this version, which is uh, 0.8.9. And I'm going to be creating a lower flat plane appliance. Now, I've already brought in the models. I'm assuming that if you're watching this video, you already know how to do that. It was simply by clicking Import Models, finding the files, and then bringing them in. So, anyway, uh, at this point, I'm going to go ahead and just design. Uh, I need to get this one for uh, an existing patient made. So um, just kind of bear with me and I'll try to walk through the process as I'm making it and kind of address some of the things that um, the, the common hiccups that uh, you might encounter in your own cases. So first of all, a lot of people ask me, how do you, um, you know, how, how did you, how did I get them out the, the, uh, geez, how do I get the models articulated in such a manner? As you can see there, the bite is already open. Uh, might not be open enough in the posterior, but it is already open. So we'd use a leaf gauge, take the uh, intraoral scans, the upper and lower models, insert a leaf gauge in the anterior, open them up, and then scan the posterior both sides so that we can create an open bite. Now this was actually designed initially for an NTI, or an anterior to programmer. Um, unfortunately, uh, even with a lower SX2 oppose it, uh, he's breaking his NTI, which is actually a good sign, not a good sign, it's a sign that he's not a good NTI candidate, because if he's breaking it, that means he's continuing to occlude, even though it's really not an appliance that's meant for someone that's going to continue to clinch down. So I'm going to transition him to a lower flat plane appliance. I don't claim to be uh, an expert on all things occlusion beyond the expertise we all should have as treating clinicians, but um, yeah, I, I have my ways of working through things. Um, and just take this video, whether you agree with my philosophy in this particular case, this video is more about talking about how to design rather than why. So, all right. Uh, first of all, um, I need to come over here. I am going to make this a man. Uh, I have to select which jaw, so the mandible. And flat plane has already been selected, but there we go. I've already imported the models. Now I'm gonna hit select a splint model. So this is which model we're actually gonna make this splint on. And then which, this, this, this right here gives us an opportunity to change some settings. I don't usually mess with it here. I will, you'll see later these same numbers pop up where we'll get to adjust them then. Set the opposing. Now the upper is the opposing and set the landmarks. This is telling the software what's front, what's back, what's left, what's right. So we're gonna look, the software will tell you which what to do. I'm just sort of used to it, going to the central pit here, central pit here, incise the ledge does not have to be centered. And now the midline, you can go right in the size of papilla, you can go wherever you want. I tend to just come right up here, click there. And so this gives us an opportunity to kind of evaluate. This does not have to be perfect, but it gives you a little bit of an idea how things look, okay? Let's click finish. So now it's going to actually bring in an articulator, which is cool to look at, um, but it's not really something that I consider that functional in the software. It's more about just kind of bringing the digital and making it look like what we're used to looking at on our lab bench. So I even tend to turn it off by just left clicking, running this little eye, visible, or visible, invisible, visible, invisible. So just turning that off. Now. Down here, you're gonna usually on the left, we're just kind of walking through one step at a time. We've continued to work through. Now, if I wanted to change the articular values, various slopes and whatnot, I can do that. I very rarely, if ever, do that. But I will change the pin setting here because I think that I need a little more space back here between these second molars. Maybe I don't, but I'm gonna go ahead and give myself about an extra millimeter back there. Um, yeah, I, I just, I, I'm afraid that he's going to break it. So maybe I'll go for another half millimeter, which means I'm going to add a millimeter up front because that's about half a millimeter in the back or thereabouts. So I'm going to go to change pin setting, click here, and I'm going to increase this to one and then click OK. And it just opened it up from where the pin would be about one millimeter. And that gave me just a little bit more room in the posterior. Um, yeah, so probably, it, was that necessary? Who knows? Uh, it's hard to say, but I'm going to go with that. That's how you change it if you need to. If you took it in occlusion and you needed to open it up, there you go. Um, you're probably going to be opening it up to get a full arch appliance. You're probably going to be opening it up four or five millimeters. We're, we're so used to talking about two millimeters and whatever. That's not, that's going to be almost nothing in the posterior. Remember, it's about half whatever you put in the front is what's going to be opened up in the posterior. Okay, so we're done with all that. I can always recover. If I don't like it, it'll go back to normal. Now, I'm going to survey the model. I'm going to click here, and this is where I get to determine what's the path of insertion, okay? So, this, I'm holding the, the wheel button on my mouse. If I press the left button, it allows me just to click things and doesn't really help, at least not in this mode. 
Um, right doesn't either yet now. I'll have to show that later. But if I want to slide things around instead of toggle it around like this, I hold the shift button on my keyboard. All right. So I'm going to look at what's an ideal path of draw, what I think is, and I'm going to click capture view. When I do that, you can see this arrow is is following that, and I can see the shadows. The shadows are where my undercuts are. And I'm looking to sort of minimize my undercuts, or at least strategically position them. Now I'm seeing a lot back here. Now he's got a lot, you know, a significant lingual version of these posterior teeth. They're all tipped in, so I'm, that's going to be unavoidable. The question is, is what's the best I can get? Honestly, I'm pretty happy with it as is. Um, if I said, you know what, there's, you know, I can make these undercuts a little more and those other ones back, uh, worse, I can just click right here and say, tweak to the posterior. Notice that the anterior undercuts get bigger, but that means that the posterior are going to get smaller. So, um, is that, and I, I can go left, right, wherever you want to go. So I'm going to come back to about here. And yeah, I think that's about it. So I'm going to say commit. That's the path of draw I now want. And the software forces me to save here. So I'm going to click the save. I'm going to pause my video so I don't have to edit this out later where I'm saving it. But this is just forces you to save in case there's an error for you to be able to recover from. All right, so now this check mark has been checked. That means I have saved it. So now I'm going to click on a refractory model. And what this is going to do is going to create a model that it gets rid of all the undercuts. Okay, you'll see in a second. Now I'm going to tell you that I like to dial this down to 0 0.6, to 0 0.06, because I'm using the key splint soft material, and it allows for a tighter fit. And I want to increase the undercuts, so I don't want to completely get rid of the undercuts. I want to have a little bit so that it snaps on and off. So now I'm going to click OK, and we're going to wait for a second, well, for for a little bit while the computer calculates this new refractory model. Um, there are various uh, settings in here that can actually be turned to be automated, um, and these are not running automated for me right now. But that's a you can look, uh, ask around in the forums to figure out how to set that up. I'm not going to go over that in this video. So you can see where it's it's like it's waxed out all these undercuts. Okay. It's important to note because when you design your splint, you can go down below those, but they're just going to be setting off the teeth. So um, they're not going to be really helping you much when you extend your, your uh, splint further below that. Now I'm going to go ahead and mark my splint outline. So this is all going to be you know user dependent, however you like it. Now I don't have the back of this third molar, which I don't like it when these are missed. But honestly, it's a third molar, so it's pretty tricky. Can't really you know blame anyone there for that. So I'm going to come around here, and I'm going to try to engage pretty low on the buckle out here, because um, uh, I'm not going to have as much retention in the lingual as I would ordinarily like. And I'm going to come up pretty high on the anterior just because most people, I think, will probably prefer this design when they're um, designing their own splints. So I'm just kind of showing you how you might do that. You can go all the way down to the gingiva if you want. Um, don't think it really matters one way or the other. But yeah, I'm going to go ahead and yeah, I'm going to wrap all the way around this guy because I've got it. And remember, you can always trim back your appliance uh, with a handpiece if you decide that, you know what, I went farther than I really needed to. Um, and if you ever think that, you know what, I want to move a, a node, move it down a little farther or wherever, you can just click on the node. And let's uh, progress forward. I just want to show you that. Let's imagine that I'm drawing my line and I click here and I'm like, oh, no, I meant to add another one. Well, I can always click there, and that's added another one. Plus, these two, which is kind of odd. I'm not really sure how that happened, but now they're joined. They, were, they got disconnected. And that got disconnected because I, um, I jumped from one to the other. I don't usually do that. I'm just kind of showing you examples. It's not usually that tricky. So I jumped up pretty high in that premolar on the other side, so I'm going to go ahead and move this up here, so I'm kind of being the same thing on both of them. And I'm just, if you notice, I'm going just below the um, the line of the undercuts, because I know that my designing my guide to engage them, so I might as well extend down there a little ways. Now I am going to try and bypass this 
mist area as much as I can because I don't want the software to have issues rendering where there's just little cracks and stuff. I'm not saying it will, but it could. So let's bring this down a little farther. Let's bring this down a little ways. You see how the it's dripping in there? That's fine, it, or dipping in there. If I want to add a node, there you go. It kind of evens that out a little bit. Maybe bring this down a touch, this down a touch. Anytime you see the red lines, it means it's hard. Ca it's having a hard time calculating. Sometimes it figures it out on its own. Sometimes you just need to add a node to sort of make those red lines go away. I'd say that looks pretty good. I do like to look around everywhere to make sure it's where I want it, but also to make sure there's no red lines remaining. And I think we're looking pretty darn good here. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and say next. Now it wants me to use this little dropper to drop, you know, to, to indicate what's the inside and what's the outside, or not indicate the outside, but to click on the inside. And it turns it all a different color. It's different different colors each time. I don't really know the logic when it's which color it is, but now I click next, and you're going to see a nice crisp line. Okay, and that's just telling you, yep, it separated this data from this. If it all was green, that's a problem. You go back and you need to fix your line. Somewhere in your line, there was a red part. It, was, it dripped into the model. It wasn't continuous. There's something wrong with your line if, it's a, if it does not create this nice separation in colors. Okay, so now I'm going to go ahead and click Next. And I'm going to take a drink of my coffee. All right. So now we can, these are some of those things that can be automated, and it's it's sad, but I can't remember how, like how to turn the automation back on. I really need oh auto background, duh, <laughs> it's not checked. If auto background is checked, these next few steps will happen automatically, um, but they aren't. So I'm gonna go ahead and dial this up to yeah, because I know that he got a pretty tight bite. I'm gonna go all the way up to 1.7577. And click OK. And now it's going to create a shell over top of everything that's that thickness. And that's also a nice little confirmation that at 1.75, I've actually got no interference. You can look through this way to see if the blue sticks through. So this is going to be a pretty strong um, uh, overall uh, appliance. I could possibly even go back and um, undo that opening of the, um, of the bite because truth is, at 1.77, I have even more space to go. I don't really need it that thick, but okay, whatever. Minimum shell thickness. Um, this is something I don't usually do, um, because what it's doing is you're just introducing a, a minimum thickness. If you're used to CAD design, crown design, it's important so you know that you don't have a thin spot. I don't really like this because, or I don't, I think it's kind of pointless, because if you are thin, all the, all the software is going to do is try to ignore that or it's going to increase the spot there. Well, you're just going to have high occlusion on that spot and you're going to have to grind it off anyways uh, or everything else can be out of occlusion. So I don't really like that, but you do need to click that for some of the other operations to work. Um, Patrick, the, the software designer, is going to try to get that so that's not necessary. Some people like to use it, but so that it's not necessary. But for the meantime, make sure you do that. So now we're going to go ahead and mark our occlusal curves and the software is going to tell you where that um, is what those usually are, and that's usually going to be on the buckle cusps of the um, upper teeth. I'm basically looking for the farthest outside of occlusion, if that makes sense. And what we're going to be doing is almost creating a wax rim, a virtual wax rim to build up against and then cut the occlusion back dirt virtually. Okay, so now let's mark the mandibular. And go right in the central grooves. You know what? I'm going to go wider with him. And I try to stick sort of as lingual as possible. That's a little bit interesting one right here because he's got, he jumps into crossbite right up there. So, oh well, whatever. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and say commit and wax uh, rim. So let's click here just to show you what's happening. When I click this, splint wax rim, 
I'm just going to go ahead and say OK. And there it is. That's the virtual rocks rim that's being created. And now I can say fuse it. If you haven't crypt the minimum thickness, you won't be able to fuse the two. That's what I found. Um, and so one of the things he's working on. So anyway, you can see that it, it hits the opposing. That's important. We want that. Uh, and then the next part of the workflow, we're going to get rid of all that. OK, so now we're going to go ahead. We can remesh and smooth, which is smoothing everything out. I'm going to go ahead and click this. I'm going to skip that for now. And that just fills in the areas that are sort of blocked out. And it smooths it. It didn't used to smooth at the same time. Now it does. Thank you, Patrick. Um, and so honestly, I'm done at this point. You can be, you can get sort of, um, you can get more creative using the sculpt tools, but I don't use that. Okay, so just click. If you if you do that and you can't figure it out, you're kind of stuck. When you just click Finish Paint Sculpt, it'll get back to the normal workflow. Um, and other than that, um, I'm pretty much you know I'm done with designing this any further or with, with uh, smoothness and whatnot. So now I'm going to go ahead and I'm click mo Mark Posterior Contacts. So now we need to develop our our plane of occlusion, our flat plane. Now you can do as many of these cusps as you want, but I like to go all of them and I would be you know I, I encourage anyone that's using the software to join Patrick's Facebook group so that um, for D3 splint or D3 tool users maybe um, so that you can sort of see other how other people use the software this is just me um, but uh, yeah so what we're doing is we're creating, you know, our mallets are not flat, and so a truly flat plane is impossible, but it creates sort of a mesh that um, you know, incorporates all of our cusps and our contact areas. So this is going to create an appliance, or it's going to cut the appliance in such a manner so that everything hits concurrently. If I wanted to, I believe I can right-click a spot, yeah, and it disappears. If you don't, you know, you potentially don't want that to be an occlusion, which is fine, but um, I don't want it to accidentally be an occlusion. So maybe it's not, you know, I, I like to just go ahead and hit all of them so I'm not worried about something interfering in some manner. So again, I'm up for just open for discussion there, but we'll go ahead and leave that. Click next. So this is this plane that's been created, and I'm going to go ahead and it's, um, do I like it? Whatever. I'm going to go ahead and say commit. So now you saw the previous appliance. Let's where is that? Um, geez, uh, there's the splint shell. Yeah, you can see how it's intersecting within it. Now, if I click subtract posterior plane, you don't have to turn that on, by the way. I'm just showing you because of the, the purpose of making the video. But when I click subtract posterior plane, it cuts out everything above that plane. So now you can see we've got this nice, like, you know, ramping, you know, smooth thing. And that's basically your, your, your flat plan, flat plane appliance. If all you want is centric stops, if you just want them to build a butt like normal and not, then you're done. Okay. So if you want though, you can take the step further. This is optional. I'm going to go ahead and save right now. Um, just so that, you know, cause I'm making a video here, but, um, at this point, I can also take it a step further and so that when they grind and move around, they can all, it also creates pathways for them. So click generate functional uh, and, uh, pathway. Okay, I think that's what it's called, F functional surface. So now you see the whole mouth moving around. <clears throat> so it's gonna create another little, you know, mesh, if you, whatever you wanna call it, that represents all the possible movements based on, you know, known values known averages of movement, okay? And that art, that articulator that was first brought in. So if you don't trust that articulator, don't do that. You can do all your, you know, your uh, guiding uh, adjustments in the mouth. But here is that. So now if I click subtract functional surface, it, it removes all those things as well, which isn't real obvious here, but I guess just trust me, I didn't show it, but it now made it even, it further removed it. Hence the reason it's sloped right here. Okay. So now um, I can also, let's turn off the opposing, or the, yeah, the opposing, the upper. That's why there's the streaks. Those are from the functional pathways. I can say grind MIP or, <laughs> sorry. If I hit grind MIP, all that's going to do is grind out any centric stops one last time. The reason it's there 
is sometimes it's nice to come up here and click Remesh Smooth. It's going to smooth everything off, but it also kind of screws up things a little bit because it cut out areas that you may have wanted to, you know, it's now not actually totally true, okay? Let me see. So now the teeth are gonna be intersecting a little more. So what you can do now is you can say grind MIP. And so there's all those little spots sort of reground into it, okay? That remesh smooth um, probably isn't really a good idea anymore. It used to be good, um, so I don't necessarily recommend that anymore, but I'm showing you why that was brought up in other videos and what that does. I'm gonna go ahead and hit Control Z, Control Z, Control Z, Control Z. So now I've gotten rid of that remesh smooth because I don't need that. I'm just gonna make the appliance like this, okay? Uh, I can polish anything off that I don't want in the lab, uh, but I now know it's true. It's removed the, the contacts and it's removed the, the functional pathway. Now, if you notice, if you roll this guide underneath, all this guide is intersecting with it. You couldn't print this and make it work because it's still inside the lower teeth. That's where clicking finalize splint is going to remove that refractory model that we created earlier, that model that is basically a representation of our pathway. Just click OK. And so now, oh, jinx myself. Um, it didn't work. So Control Z, finalize splint, change it to carve, click OK. And sit here and wait for a second. And it worked. So that's why he gives you two different options to finalize the splint. Probably a good thing in this video that it didn't work because then you can see when it doesn't, try just changing which method. Hit Control Z and change the method that it, that it made the cut. Look at this down here. This is where it's sticking through the model because, let's go ahead and show. That's where the, the data was missed. So you need to be aware of that. We're gonna to wanna to cut that off. Obviously it won't see. Not a big deal. I'm not gonna mess with it here. I'm not even gonna mess with it anywhere other than after it's printed. It just does not matter. Um, it's not worth the effort of trying to you know, edit the virtual uh, design for that. But here is our appliance. Fully designed, ready to print, and uh, that's about it. When I print it, um, I will have my assistants print it like this. So if this is the print bed down here, technically it's gonna be 180 degrees because it's gonna be hanging you know, against gravity, but this is how I'm gonna knock it back at about 45 degrees, at least if not 75 degrees, so it's fairly vertical. And that's how I print. I've made other videos about that. Hopefully this video helps some of you that are looking to make a flat plane appliance. Um, and I think, uh, oh, real quick, if you click right here, generate report, it shows you all the things you did so that if you decide that, hey, you know what, um, it wasn't thick enough or it was too tight or it was too, it, it fit tight, but it didn't lock in. So, you know, if it fits snugly, but you know, it pops out, you might want to go ahead and, you know, allow a, a larger undercut. If it doesn't seat period, you might have to have more spacer. Or if it's wiggly in there, you might have to have less spacer. So these are the two main values I take from this. It also shows you articulator values, but, um, you know, and then if you're also making an interior programmer, uh, it'll show you the values for that. So I like to go ahead and save. Um, when you export your splint, if you've generated this report, when you export it, it will also spit out this as a text file. And then go ahead and make sure that you always, at the end, save. All right, I'm going to finish this video right here. Hopefully it's helpful. If you uh, like this video, make sure to check out my YouTube channel. Also check out my website. Um, it is baringrutterdds.com. And uh, if you want to see other new videos that come out as they come out, go ahead and subscribe and then you will get notified. All right. Thank you. Thanks again. Bye for now.